Hey everyone, it is I, D.B. Spitzer, here with week four of Edgar Allan Poe, The Collected Works, The Raven Edition. So that's volume four. Yeah, that's that's what we got going on on Black Clock Audio Tales. Also, we have, uh, at some point in time, soon, we're going to have Ken Height talking about Edgar Allan Poe and some Dave from Dave's Corner of the Universe and Dave's Underground Goat Shenanigans reading some Poe for us. So here we are. Edgar Allan Poe, and of course, as always, this episode is brought to you by BunnySlippers.com. Keep your feet warm this winter. Don't, 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 uh, don't, don't succumb to, to frostbite. Just make sure you wear slippers. It's a good plan, but, you know, if you're going outside in subarctic temperatures, wear more than bunny slippers. Just word of advice. BunnySlippers.com. Don't die of a Exhaustion and exposure. Yeah. Also, found item clothing. Wear cool shirts from your favorite cool cult films of the 80s and 90s and some 70s stuff. Okay. All right. And also, of course, check out Articulate Warbling with Zach Ferguson. Look for him and Dave's Underground Goat Shenanigans on pgttcm.com. And you can follow us on Instagram. You can follow us on Facebook. And you can follow us on Twitter, pgttcm.com, Black Clock Audio Tales. Just search for those two things and you will find us out in the world, on the internet, all that fun stuff. All right, Edgar Allan Poe, right now. And remember, hey, sorry, (laughs) remember, if you want people to know about it, share it with other people, let other people know about it, Uh, rate, review, give it us uh, five stars on the Amazon, and uh, not Amazon, the iTunes, or Stitcher, or whatever. Uh, Thank you so much. Section 14, Loss of Breath. By Edgar Allan Poe. The most notorious ill fortune must in the end yield to the untiring courage of philosophy, as the most stubborn city to the ceaseless vigilance of an enemy. Shalmanezer, as we have it in holy writings, lay three years before Samaria, yet it fell. Sardanapalus, see Diodorus, maintained himself seven in Nineveh, but to no purpose. Troy expired at the close of the second lustrum, and Azoth, as Aristaeus declares upon his honor as a gentleman, opened at last her gates to Sametechus, after having barred them for the fifth part of a century. Thou wretch, thou vixen, thou shrew, said I to my wife on the morning after our wedding. Thou witch, thou hag, thou whippersnapper, thou sink of iniquity thou fierce-faced quintessence of all that is abominable, thou, thou, here standing upon tiptoe, seizing her by the throat, and placing my mouth close to her ear, I was prepared to launch forth a new and more decided epithet of opprobrium, which should not fail, if ejaculated, to convince her of her insignificance, when to my extreme horror and astonishment I discovered that I had lost my breath. The phrases... I am out of breath, I have lost my breath, etc., are often enough repeated in common conversation. But it had never occurred to me that the terrible accident of which I speak could bona fide and actually happen. Imagine, that is, if you have a fanciful turn. Imagine, I say, my wonder, my consternation, my despair. There is a good genius, however, which has never entirely deserted me. In my most ungovernable moods, I still retain a sense of propriety. Et le chemin des passions de conduit, as Lord Edward in the Julie says it did him, a la philosophie veritable. Although I could not at first precisely ascertain to what degree the occurrence had affected me, I determined at all events to conceal the matter from my wife until further experience should discover to me the extent of this my unheard-of calamity. Altering my countenance, therefore, in a moment, from its bepuffed and distorted appearance to an expression of arch and coquettish benignity, I gave my lady a pat on the one cheek and a kiss on the other, and without saying one syllable, furies, I could not, left her astonished at my drollery as I pirouetted out of the room in a pas de zephyr. Behold me, then, safely ensconced in my private boudoir, 
a fearful instance of the ill consequences attending upon irascibility, alive, with the qualifications of the dead, dead, with the propensities of the living, an anomaly on the face of the earth, being very calm, yet breathless. Yes, breathless. I am serious in asserting that my breath was entirely gone. I could not have stirred with it a feather if my life had been at issue, or sullied even the delicacy of a mirror. Hard fate! Yet there was some alleviation to the first overwhelming paroxysm of my sorrow. I found upon trial that the powers of utterance which, upon my inability to proceed in the conversation with my wife, I then concluded to be totally destroyed, were in fact only partially impeded, and I discovered that had I, at that interesting crisis, dropped my voice to a singularity deep guttural, I might still have continued to her the communication of my sentiments. This pitch of voice, the guttural, depending, I find, not upon the current of the breath, but upon a certain spasmodic action of the muscles of the throat. Throwing myself upon a chair, I remained for some time absorbed in meditation. My reflections, to be sure, were of no consolatory kind. A thousand vague and lacrimatory fancies took possession of my soul, and even the idea of suicide flitted across my brain. But it is a trait in the perversity of human nature to reject the obvious and the ready for the far distant and equivocal. Thus I shuddered at self-murder as the most decided of atrocities while the tabby cat purred strenuously upon the rug, and the very water-dog wheezed assiduously under the table, each taking to itself much merit for the strength of its lungs, and all obviously done in derision of my own pulmonary incapacity. Oppressed with a tumult of vague hopes and fears, I at length heard the footsteps of my wife descending the staircase. Being now assured of her absence, I returned with a palpitating heart to the scene of my disaster. Carefully locking the door on the inside, I commenced a vigorous search. It was possible, I thought, that, concealed in some obscure corner, or lurking in some closet or drawer, might be found the object of my inquiry. It might have a vapory, it might even have a tangible form. Most philosophers, upon many points of philosophy, are still very unphilosophical. William Godwin, however, says in his Mandeville that invisible things are the only realities, and this, all will allow, is a case in point. I would have the judicious reader pause before accusing such asseverations of an undue quantum of absurdity. Anaxagoras, it will be remembered, maintained that snow is black, and this I have since found to be the case. Long and earnestly did I continue the investigation, but the contemptible reward of my industry and perseverance proved to be only a set of false teeth, two pair of hips, an eye, and a bundle of billet doux from Mr. Windenough to my wife. I might as well here observe that this confirmation of my lady's partiality for Mr. W. occasioned me little uneasiness. That Mrs. Lackobreath should admire anything so dissimilar to myself was a natural and necessary evil. I am, it is well known, of a robust and corpulent appearance, and at the same time somewhat diminutive in stature. What wonder, then, that the lath-like tenuity of my acquaintance and his altitude, which has grown into a proverb, should have met with all due estimation in the eyes of Mrs. Lackobreath. But to return. My exertions, as I have said before, proved fruitless. Closet after closet, drawer after drawer, corner after corner, were scrutinized to no purpose. At one time, however, I thought myself sure of my prize, having, in rummaging a dressing case, accidentally demolished a bottle of Grand Jean's Oil of Archangels, which, as an agreeable perfume, I here take the liberty of recommending. With a heavy heart, I returned to my boudoir, there to ponder upon some method of eluding my wife's penetration, until I could make arrangements prior to my leaving the country, for to this I had already made up my mind. In a foreign climate, being unknown, I might, with some probability of success, endeavor to conceal my unhappy calamity, a calamity calculated even more than beggary, to estrange the affections of the multitude, and to draw down upon the wretch the well-merited indignation of the virtuous and the happy. 
I was not long in hesitation. Being naturally quick, I committed to memory the entire tragedy of Metamora. I had the good fortune to recollect that in the accentuation of this drama, or at least of such portion of it as is allotted to the hero, the tones of voice in which I found myself deficient were altogether unnecessary, and the deep guttural was expected to reign monotonously throughout. I practiced for some time by the borders of a well-frequented marsh. Herein, however, having no reference to a similar proceeding of Demosthenes, but from a design peculiarly and conscientiously my own. Thus armed at all points, I determined to make my wife believe that I was suddenly smitten with a passion for the stage. In this I succeeded to a miracle, and to every question or suggestion found myself at liberty to reply in my most frog-like and sepulchral tones with some passage from the tragedy any portion of which, as I soon took great pleasure in observing, would apply equally well to any particular subject. It is not to be supposed, however, that in the delivery of such passages I was found at all deficient in the looking asquint, the showing my teeth, the working my knees, the shuffling my feet, or in any of those unmentionable graces which are now justly considered the characteristics of a popular performer. To be sure, they spoke of confining me in a straitjacket, but, good God, they never suspected me of having lost my breath. Having at length put my affairs in order, I took my seat very early one morning in the mail stage for giving it to be understood among my acquaintances that business of the last importance required my immediate personal attendance in that city. The coach was crammed to repletion, but in the uncertain twilight the features of my companions could not be distinguished. Without making any effectual resistance, I suffered myself to be placed between two gentlemen of colossal dimensions, while a third, of a size larger, requesting pardon for the liberty he was about to take, threw himself upon my body at full length, and falling asleep in an instant, drowned all my guttural ejaculations for relief in a snore which would have put to blush the roarings of the bull of Phalaris. Happily, the state of my respiratory faculties rendered suffocation an accident entirely out of the question. As, however, the day broke more distinctly in our approach to the outskirts of the city, my tormentor, arising and adjusting his shirt-collar, thanked me in a very friendly manner for my civility. Seeing that I remained motionless, all my limbs were dislocated and my head twisted on one side, his apprehensions began to be excited, and arousing the rest of the passengers, he communicated in a very decided manner his opinion that a dead man had been palmed upon them during the night for a living and responsible fellow traveler. Here, giving me a thump on the right eye by way of demonstrating the truth of his suggestion. Hereupon all, one after another, there were nine in company, believed it their duty to pull me by the ear. A young practicing physician, too, having applied a pocket mirror to my mouth, and found me without breath. The assertion of my persecutor was pronounced a true bill, and the whole party expressed a determination to endure tamely no such impositions for the future, and to proceed no farther with any such carcasses for the present. I was here, accordingly, thrown out at the sign of the crow, by which tavern the coach happened to be passing, without meeting with any farther accident than the breaking of both my arms under the left hind wheel of the vehicle. I must besides do the driver the justice to state that he did not forget to throw after me the largest of my trunks, which, unfortunately, falling on my head, fractured my skull in a manner at once interesting and extraordinary. The landlord of the crow, who is a hospitable man, finding that my trunk contained sufficient to indemnify him for any little trouble he might take in my behalf, sent forthwith for a surgeon of his acquaintance, and delivered me to his care with a bill and receipt for ten dollars. The purchaser took me to his apartments and commenced operations immediately. Having cut off my ears, however, he discovered signs of animation. He now rang the bell and sent for a neighboring apothecary with whom to consult in the emergency. In case of his suspicions with regard to my existence proving ultimately correct, he, in the meantime, made an incision in my stomach and removed several of my viscera for private dissection. The apothecary had an idea that I was actually dead, 
This idea I endeavored to confute, kicking and plunging with all my might, and making the most furious contortions, for the operations of the surgeon had, in a measure, restored me to the possession of my faculties. All, however, was attributed to the effects of a new galvanic battery, wherewith the apothecary, who is really a man of information, performed several curious experiments, in which, from my personal share in their fulfillment, I could not help feeling deeply interested. It was a course of mortification to me, nevertheless, that although I made several attempts at conversation, my powers of speech were so entirely in abeyance that I could not even open my mouth, much less then make reply to some ingenious but fanciful theories of which, under other circumstances, my minute acquaintance with the Hippocratian pathology would have afforded me a ready confutation. Not being able to arrive at a conclusion, the practitioners remanded me for farther examination. I was taken up into a garret, and the surgeon's lady having accommodated me with drawers and stockings, the surgeon himself fastened my hands and tied up my jaws with a pocket handkerchief, then bolted the door on the outside as he hurried to his dinner, leaving me alone to silence and to meditation. I now discovered to my extreme delight that I could have spoken had not my mouth been tied up with the pocket handkerchief. Consoling myself with this reflection, I was mentally repeating some passages of the omnipresence of the deity, as is my custom before resigning myself to sleep, when two cats, of a greedy and vituperative turn, entering at a hole in the wall, leaped up with a flourish a la Catalani, and alighting opposite one another on my visage, betook themselves to indecorous contention for the paltry consideration of my nose but, as the loss of his ears proved the means of elevating to the throne of Cyrus the Magian or Majgush of Persia, and as the cutting off his nose gave Zopyrus possession of Babylon, so the loss of a few ounces of my countenance proved the salvation of my body. Aroused by the pain, and burning with indignation, I burst at a single effort the fastenings and the bandage. Stalking across the room, I cast a glance of contempt at the belligerents, and throwing open the sash to their extreme horror and disappointment, precipitated myself very dexterously from the window. This moment passing from the city jail to the scaffold erected for his execution in the suburbs. His extreme infirmity and long-continued ill health had obtained him the privilege of remaining unmanacled, and habited in his gallows costume, one very similar to my own, he lay at full length in the bottom of the hangman's cart, which happened to be under the windows of the surgeon at the moment of my precipitation, without any other guard than the driver, who was asleep, and two recruits of the 6th Infantry who were drunk. As ill luck would have it, I alit upon my feet within the vehicle. Immediately he bolted out behind, and turned down an alley, and was out of sight in the twinkling of an eye. The recruits, aroused by the bustle, could not exactly comprehend the merits of the transaction. Seeing, however, a man, the precise counterpart of the felon, standing upright in the cart before their eyes, they were of, so they expressed themselves, and having communicated this opinion to one another, they took each a dram, and then knocked me down with the butt-ends of their muskets. It was not long ere we arrived at the place of destination. Of course nothing could be said in my defense. Hanging was my inevitable fate. I resigned myself thereto with a feeling half stupid, half acrimonious. Being little of a cynic, I had all the sentiments of a dog. The hangman, however, adjusted the noose about my neck. The drop fell. I forbear to depict my sensations upon the gallows, although here, undoubtedly, I could speak to the point, and it is a topic upon which nothing has been well said. In fact, to write upon such a theme, it is necessary to have been hanged. Every author should confine himself to matters of experience. Thus, Mark Antony composed a treatise upon getting drunk. I may just mention, however, that die I did not. My body was, but I had no breath to be suspended, and but for the knot under my left ear, which had the feel of a military stock, I dare say that I should have experienced very little inconvenience. As for the jerk given to my neck upon the falling of the drop, it merely proved a corrective to the twist afforded me by the fat gentleman in the coach. For good reasons, however, I did my best to give the crowd the worth of their trouble. My convulsions were said to be extraordinary. 
My spasms it would have been difficult to beat. The populace encored. Several gentlemen swooned, and a multitude of ladies were carried home in hysterics. Pinksit availed himself of the opportunity to retouch, from a sketch taken upon the spot, his admirable painting of the Marcias flayed alive. When I had afforded sufficient amusement, it was thought proper to remove my body from the gallows. This the more especially, as the real culprit had in the meantime been retaken and recognized, a fact which I was so unlucky as not to know. Much sympathy was, of course, exercised in my behalf, and as no one made claim to my corpse, it was ordered that I should be interred in a public vault. Here, after due interval, I was deposited. The sexton departed, and I was left alone. A line of Marston's malcontent. Death's a good fellow and keeps open house, struck me at that moment as a palpable lie. I knocked off, however, the lid of my coffin, and stepped out. The place was dreadfully dreary and damp, and I became troubled with ennui. By way of amusement, I felt my way among the numerous coffins ranged in order around. I lifted them down one by one, and breaking open their lids, busied myself in speculations about the mortality within. This, I soliloquized, tumbling over a carcass, puffy, bloated, and rotund, this has been, no doubt, in every sense of the word, an unhappy and unfortunate man. It has been his terrible lot not to walk but to waddle, to pass through life not like a human being, but like an elephant, not like a man, but like a rhinoceros. His attempts at getting on have been more abortions, and his circumgyratory proceedings a palpable failure. Taking a step forward, it has been his misfortune to take two toward the right and three toward the left. His studies have been confined to the poetry of Crabbe. He can have no idea of the wonder of a pirouette. To him, a pas de papillon has been an abstract conception. He has never ascended the summit of a hill. He has never viewed from any steeple the glories of a metropolis. Heat has been his mortal enemy. In the dog days, his days have been the days of a dog. Therein, he has dreamed of flames and suffocation, of mountains upon mountains, of Pelion upon Osa. He was short of breath. To say all in a word, he was short of breath. He thought it extravagant to play upon wind instruments. He was the inventor of self-moving fans, wind sails, and ventilators. He patronized Dupont, the bellows maker, and he died miserably in attempting to smoke a cigar. His was a case in which I feel a deep interest, a lot in which I sincerely sympathize. But here, said I, here, and I dragged spitefully from its receptacle a gaunt, tall, and peculiar-looking form, whose remarkable appearance struck me with a sense of unwelcome familiarity. Here is a wretch entitled to no earthly commiseration, Thus saying, in order to obtain a more distinct view of my subject, I applied my thumb and forefinger to its nose, and causing it to assume a sitting position upon the ground, held it thus, at the length of my arm, while I continued my soliloquy. Entitled, I repeated, to no earthly commiseration. Who, indeed, would think of compassioning a shadow? Besides, has he not had his full share of the blessings of mortality? He was the originator of tall monuments, shot towers, lightning rods, Lombardy poplars. His treatise upon shades and shadows has immortalized him. He edited with distinguished ability the last edition of South on the Bones. He went early to college and studied pneumatics. He then came home, talked eternally, and played upon the French horn. He patronized the bagpipes. Captain Barclay, who walked against time, would not walk against him. Wyndham and Albreth were his favorite writers, his favorite artist, Fizz. He died gloriously while inhaling gas, la vie flatu corrupitur, like the fama pudicate in Hieronymus. He was indubitably a... How can you, how can you, interrupted the object of my animadversions, gasping for breath and tearing off, with a desperate exertion, the bandage around its jaws. How can you, Mr. Lackobreath, be so infernally cruel as to pinch me in that manner on my nose? Did you not see how they fastened up my mouth? And you must know, if you know anything, how vast a superfluity of breath I have to dispose of. If you do not know, however, sit down and you shall see. 
in my situation it is really a great relief to be able to open one's mouth, to be able to expatiate, to be able to communicate with a person like yourself, who do not think yourself called upon at every period to interrupt the thread of a gentleman's discourse. Interruptions are annoying and should undoubtedly be abolished, don't you think so? No reply, I beg you. One person is enough to be speaking at a time, and I shall be done by and by, and then you may begin. How the devil, sir, did you get into this place? Not a word, I beseech you. Been here some time myself. Terrible accident. Heard of it, I suppose? Awful calamity. Walking under your windows some short while ago, about the time you were stage-struck. Horrible occurrence. Heard of catching one's breath, eh? Hold your tongue, I tell you. I caught somebody else's. Had always too much of my own. Met Blab at the corner of the street. Wouldn't give me a chance for a word. Couldn't get in a syllable edgeways. Attacked, consequently, with epilepsis. Blab made his escape. Damn all fools. They took me up for dead, and put me in this place. Pretty doings, all of them. Heard all you said about me. Every word a lie. Horrible. Wonderful. Outrageous. Hideous. Incomprehensible. Etc., 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 etc. It is impossible to conceive my astonishment at so unexpected a discourse, or the joy with which I became gradually convinced that the breath so fortunately caught by the gentleman, whom I soon recognized as my neighbor, wind enough, was in fact the identical expiration mislaid by myself in the conversation with my wife. Time, place, and circumstances rendered it a matter beyond question. I did not at least during the long period in which the inventor of Lombardy poplars continued to favor me with his explanations. In this respect I was actuated by that habitual prudence which has never been my predominating trait. I reflected that many difficulties might still lie in the path of my preservation, which only extreme exertion on my part would be able to surmount. Many persons, I considered, are prone to estimate commodities in their possession, however valueless to the then proprietor, however troublesome or distressing, in direct ratio with the advantages to be derived by others from their attainment, or by themselves from their abandonment. Might not this be the case with Mr. Windenough? Is displaying anxiety for the breath of which he was at present so willing to get rid, might I not lay myself open to the exactions of his avarice? There are scoundrels in this world, I remembered with a sigh, who will not scruple to take unfair opportunities with even a next-door neighbor. And, this remark is from Epictetus, it is precisely at that time when men are most anxious to throw off the burden of their own calamities that they feel the least desirous of relieving them in others. Upon considerations similar to these, and still retaining my grasp upon the nose of Mr. W., I accordingly thought proper to model my reply. Monster, I began, in a tone of the deepest indignation. Monster and double-winded idiot, dost thou, whom for thine iniquities it has pleased heaven to accurse with a twofold respimption, dost thou, I say, presume to address me in the familiar language of an old acquaintance? I lie, forsooth, and hold my tongue, to be sure. Pretty conversation, indeed, to a gentleman with a single breath. All this, too, when I have it in my power to relieve the calamity under which thou dost so justly suffer, to curtail the superfluities of thine unhappy respiration. Like Brutus, I paused for a reply, with which, like a tornado, Mr. Windenough immediately overwhelmed me. Protestation followed upon protestation, and apology upon apology. There were no terms with which he was unwilling to comply, and there were none of which I failed to take the fullest advantage. Preliminaries being at length arranged, my acquaintance delivered me the respiration, for which, having carefully examined it, I gave him afterward a receipt. I am aware that by many I shall be held to blame for speaking in a manner so cursory, of a transaction so impalpable. It will be thought that I should have entered more minutely into the details of an occurrence by which, and this is very true, much new light might be thrown upon a highly interesting branch of physical philosophy. To all this I am sorry that I cannot reply. A hint is the only answer which I am permitted to make. There were circumstances, and I think it much safer upon consideration to say as little as possible about an affair so delicate, so delicate, I repeat, and at the time involving the interests of a third party, whose sulfurous resentment I have not the least desire at this moment of incurring. 
We were not long after this necessary arrangement in effecting an escape from the dungeons of the sepulchre. The united strength of our resuscitated voices was soon sufficiently apparent. Scissors, the Whig editor, republished a treatise upon the nature and origin of subterranean noises. A reply, rejoinder, confutation, and justification followed in the columns of a democratic gazette. It was not until the opening of the vault to decide the controversy that the appearance of Mr. Windenough and myself proved both parties to have been decidedly in the wrong. I cannot conclude these details of some very singular passages in a life at all times sufficiently eventful without again recalling to the attention of the reader the merits of that indiscriminate philosophy which is a sure and ready shield against those shafts of calamity which can neither be seen, felt, nor fully understood. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that, among the ancient Hebrews, it was believed the gates of heaven would be inevitably opened to that sinner or saint who, with good lungs and implicit confidence, should vociferate the word, Amen. It was in the spirit of this wisdom that, when a great plague raged at Athens, and every means had been in vain attempted for its removal, Epimenides, as Laertius relates in his second book of that philosopher, advised the erection of a shrine and temple to the proper god. End of section 14. Recording by Lee Smalley. Recording by Wupahipo. The Man That Was Used Up by Edgar Allan Poe. A Tale of the Late Bugaboo and Kickapoo Campaign. Pleurez, pleurez, messieurs, et fondez vous en eau. La moitié de ma vie a mis l'autre au tombeau. Corneille. I cannot just now remember when or where I first made the acquaintance of the truly fine looking fellow. Brevet Brigadier General John A. B. C. Smith. Someone did introduce me to the gentleman, I am sure, at some public meeting, I know very well, held about something of great importance, no doubt, at some place or other, I feel convinced, whose name I have unaccountably forgotten. The truth is that the introduction was attended upon my part with a degree of anxious embarrassment which operated to prevent any definite impressions of either time or place. I'm constitutionally nervous. This with me is a family failing, and I can't help it. In special the slightest appearance of mystery, of any point I cannot exactly comprehend, puts me at once into a pitiable state of agitation. There was something, as it were, remarkable. Yes, remarkable although this is but a feeble term to express my full meaning, about the entire individuality of the personage in question. He was perhaps six feet in height and of a presence singularly commanding. There was an air distinct way pervading the whole man, which spoke of high breeding and hinted at high birth. Upon this topic, the topic of Smith's personal appearance, I have a kind of melancholy satisfaction in being minute. His head of hair would have done honor to a Brutus. Nothing could be more richly flowing or possess a brighter gloss. It was of a jetty black, which was also the color, or more probably the no color, of his unimaginable whiskers. You perceive I cannot speak of these latter without enthusiasm. It is not too much to say that they were the handsomest pair of whiskers under the sun. At all events they encircled, and at times partially overshadowed a mouth utterly unequalled. Here were the most entirely even and the most brilliantly white of all conceivable teeth. From between them, upon every proper occasion, issued a voice of surpassing clearness, melody and strength. In the matter of eyes also, my acquaintance was preeminently in doubt. Either one of such a pair was worth a couple of the ordinary ocular organs. They were of deep hazel, exceedingly large and lustrous, and there was perceptible about them, ever and anon, just that amount of interesting obliquity which gives pregnancy to expression. 
The bust of the general was unquestionably the finest bust I ever saw. For your life you could not have found a fault with its wonderful proportion. This rare peculiarity set off to great advantage a pair of shoulders which would have called up a blush of conscious inferiority into the countenance of the marble Apollo. I have a passion for fine shoulders and may say that I never beheld them in perfection before. The arms altogether were admirably modelled, nor were the lower limbs less superb. These were indeed the ne plus ultra of good legs. Every connoisseur in such matters admitted the legs to be good. There was neither too much flesh nor too little, neither rudeness nor fragility. I could not imagine a more graceful curve than that of the os femoris, and there was just that due gentle prominence in the rear of the fibula which goes to the confirmation of a properly proportioned calf. I wish to God my young and talented friend Cipon Cipino, the sculptor, had but seen the legs of brevet brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. But although men so absolutely fine-looking are neither as plenty as reasons or blackberries, Still, I could not bring myself to believe that the remarkable something to which I alluded just now, that the odd air of je ne sais quoi which hung about my new acquaintance, lay altogether or indeed at all in the supreme excellence of his bodily endowments. Perhaps it might be traced to the manner, yet here again I could not pretend to be positive. There was a primness, not to say stiffness, in his carriage, a degree of measured and, if I may so express it, of rectangular precision, attending his every movement, which, observed in a more diminutive figure, would have had the least little savour in the world, of affectation, pomposity or constraint, but which noticed in a gentleman of his undoubted dimensions was readily placed to the account of reserve auteur, of a commendable sense, in short, of what is due to the dignity of colossal proportion. The kind friend who presented me to General Smith whispered in my ear some few words of comment upon the man. He was a remarkable man, a very remarkable man, indeed one of the most remarkable men of the age. He was an especial favorite, too, with the ladies, chiefly on account of his high reputation for courage. In that point he is unrivaled. Indeed, he is a perfect desperado, a downright fire-eater and no mistake, said my friend, here dropping his voice excessively low and thrilling me with the mystery of his tone. A downright fire-eater and no mistake showed that, I should say, to some purpose, in the late tremendous swamp fight away down south with the Bugaboo and Kickapoo Indians. Here my friend opened his eyes to some extent. Bless my soul! Blood and thunder and all that! Prodigies of valor! Heard of him, of course? You know, he's the man... Man alive! How do you do? Why, how are you? Very glad to see you indeed. Here interrupted the general himself, seizing my companion by the hand as he drew near and bowing stiffly but profoundly as I was presented. I then thought, and I think so still, that I never heard a clearer nor a stronger voice, nor beheld a finer set of teeth, but I must say that I was sorry for the interruption just at that moment, as owing to the whispers and insinuations aforesaid, my interest had been greatly excited in the hero of the Bugaboo and Kickapoo campaign. However, the delightfully luminous conversation of Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith soon completely dissipated this chagrin. My friend, leaving us immediately, we had quite a long tete-a-tete, -tete, and I was not only pleased, but really instructed. I never heard a more fluent talker or a man of greater general information. 
With becoming modesty, he forbore nevertheless to touch upon the theme I had just then most at heart. I mean the mysterious circumstances attending the Bugaboo War, and on my own part, what I conceive to be a proper sense of delicacy forbade me to broach this subject. Although, in truth, I was exceedingly tempted to do so. I perceived, too, that the gallant soldier preferred topics of philosophical interest, and that he delighted especially in commenting upon the rapid march of mechanical invention. Indeed, lead him where I would, this was a point to which he invariably came back. There is nothing at all like it, he would say. We are a wonderful people and live in a wonderful age. Parachutes and railroads, man traps and spring guns. Our steamboats are upon every sea and the Nassau balloon packet is about to run regular trips, fare either way only 20 pounds sterling, between London and Timbuktu. And who shall calculate the immense influence upon social life, upon arts, upon commerce, upon literature, which will be the immediate result of the great principles of electromagnetics? Nor is this all, let me assure you. There is really no end to the march of invention. The most wonderful the most ingenious, and let me add Mr... Mr. Thompson, I believe, is your name. Let me add, I say, the most useful, the most truly useful mechanical contrivances are daily springing up like mushrooms, if I may so express myself, or more figuratively, like uh, grasshoppers, like grasshoppers. Mr. Thompson, about us and uh, uh, around us. Thompson, to be sure, is not my name. But it is needless to say that I left General Smith with a heightened interest in the man, with an exalted opinion of his conversational powers and a deep sense of the valuable privileges we enjoy in living in this age of mechanical invention. My curiosity, however had not been altogether satisfied, and I resolved to prosecute immediate inquiry among my acquaintances touching the brevet brigadier general himself, and particularly respecting the tremendous events quorum pars magna fuit during the Bugaboo and Kickapoo campaign. The first opportunity which presented itself, and which, Horesco reference, I did not in the least scruple to seize, occurred at the church of the Reverend Dr. Drummumup, where I found myself established one Sunday, just at sermon time, not only in the pew, but by the side of that worthy and communicative little friend of mine, Miss Tabitha T. Thus seated, I congratulated myself, and with much reason upon the very flattering state of affairs. If any person knew anything about Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith, that person, it was clear to me, was Miss Tabitha T. We telegraphed a few signals and then commenced sotto voce a brisk tete-a-tete. -tete. Smith, said she in reply to my very earnest inquiry. Smith? Why, not General John ABC? Bless me, I thought you knew all about him. This is a wonderfully inventive age. Horrid affair, that. A bloody set of wretches, those kickapoos. Fought like a hero. Prodigies of valor. Immortal renown. Smith. Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Why, you know, he's the man. Men. Here broke in Dr. Drummum up at the top of his voice and with a thump that came near knocking the pulpit about our ears. Man that is born of a woman hath but a short time to live. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. I started to the extremity of the pew and perceived by the animated looks of the divine that the wrath 
which had nearly proved fatal to the pulpit, had been excited by the whispers of the lady and myself. There was no help for it, so I submitted with a good grace and listened in all the martyrdom of dignified silence to the balance of that very capital discourse. Next evening found me a somewhat late visitor at the Rantipole Theatre, where I felt sure of satisfying my curiosity at once by merely stepping into the box of those exquisite specimens of affability and omniscience, the Misses Arabella and Miranda Cognoscenti. That fine tragedian, Climax, was doing Iago to a very crowded house, and I experienced some little difficulty in making my wishes understood, especially as our box was next to the slips and completely overlooked the stage. Smith? said Miss Arabella, as she at length comprehended the purport of my query. Smith? Why not General John ABC? Smith? inquired Miranda musingly. God bless me, did you ever behold a finer figure? Never, madam, but do tell me. Oh, so inimitable grace? Never, upon my word, but pray inform me. Also just an appreciation of stage effect. Madam. Or a more delicate sense of the true beauties of Shakespeare. Be so good as to look at that leg. The devil. And I turned again to her sister. Smith, said she. Why not General John ABC? Horrid affair that, wasn't it? Great wretches, those boogaboos. Savage and so on. But we live in a wonderfully inventive age. Smith. Oh, yes, great man. Perfect desperado. Immortal renown. Prodigies of valor. Never hurt. This was given in a scream. Bless my soul. Why, he's the man. Mandragora. Nor all the drowsy syrups of the world shall ever medicine thee to that sweet sleep which thou oudst yesterday. Here roared out Climax just in my ear, and shaking his fist in my face all the time in a way that I couldn't stand, and I wouldn't. I left the Mrs. Cognoscenti immediately, went behind the scenes forthwith, and gave the beggarly scoundrel such a trashing as I trust he will remember to the day of his death. At the soiree of the lovely widow, Miss Kathleen O'Trump, I was confident that I should meet with no similar disappointment. Accordingly, I was no sooner seated at the card table with my pretty hostess for a vis-a-vis -vis, than I propounded those questions, the solution of which had become a matter so essential to my peace. Smith, said my partner, why not General John ABC? Horrid affair that, wasn't it? Diamonds, did you say? Terrible wretches, those kickapoos. We are playing whist, if you please, Mr. Tettle. However, this is the age of invention. Most certainly the age, one may say. The age par excellence. Speak French? Oh, quite a hero. Perfect desperado. No hearts, Mr. Tuttle. I don't believe it. Immortal renown and all that. Prodigies of valor. Never hurt. Why, bless me, he's the man. Men? Captain Men? Here screamed some little feminine interloper from the farthest corner of the room. Are you talking about Captain Men and the duel? Oh, I must hear. Do tell, go on, Mrs. O'Trump. Do now go on. And go on, Miss O'Trump did, all about a certain Captain Man, who was either shot or hung, or should have been both shot and hung. Yes, Mrs. O'Trump, she went on, and I, I went off. There was no chance of hearing anything farther that evening in regard to Brevet Brigadier General John ABC Smith. Still I consoled myself with the reflection that the tide of ill luck would not run against me forever, 
and so determined to make a bold push for information at the rout of that bewitching little angel, the graceful Mrs. Pirouette. Smith? said Mrs. P. as we twirled about together in a pas de sefir. Smith? Why, not General John ABC? Dreadful business, that of the Boogaboos, wasn't it? Dreadful creatures, those Indians. Do turn out your toes. I really am ashamed of you. Man of great courage, poor fellow. But this is a wonderful age for invention. Oh, dear me, I'm out of breath. Quite a desperado. Prodigies of valor. Never heard? Can't believe it. I shall have to sit down and enlighten you. Smith, why, he's the man. Man Fred, I tell you. Here bowed out Miss Barbleu, as I led Mrs. Pirouette to a seat. Did ever anybody hear the like? It's Man Fred, I say, and not at all by any means Man Friday. Here Miss Barbleu beckoned to me in a very peremptory manner, and I was obliged, will I nil I, to leave Mrs. P. for the purpose of deciding a dispute touching the title of a certain poetical drama of Lord Byron's. Although I pronounced with great promptness that the true title was Man Friday and not by any means Man Fred, yet when I returned to seek Mrs. Pirouet she was not to be discovered, and I made my retreat from the house in a very bitter spirit of animosity against the whole race of the Bableu. Matters had now assumed a really serious aspect, and I resolved to call at once upon my particular friend, Mr. Theodore Sinivate, for I knew that here at least I should get something like definite information. Smith, said he in his well-known peculiar way of drawling out his syllables, Smith? Why, not General John ABC? Savage affair that with the Kickapoos, wasn't it? Say, don't you think so? Perfect desperado. Great pity, pon my honor. Wonderfully inventive age. Prodigies of valor. By the by, did you ever hear about Captain Man? Captain Manbead, said I, please to go on with your story. Hmm, oh well, quite la même chose, as we say in France. Smith, A, eh? Brigadier General John ABC, I say... Here Mr. S. thought proper to put his finger to the side of his nose. I say, you don't mean to insinuate now, really and truly and conscientiously, that you don't know all about that affair of Smith's, as well as I do, eh? Smith! John ABC! Why, bless me, he's the man! Mr. Sinivet, said I imploringly, is he the man in the mask? No, said he, looking wise. Nor the man in the moon. This reply I considered a pointed and positive insult, and so left the house at once in high dudgeon, with a firm resolve to call my friend Mr. Sinivet to a speedy account for his ungentlemanly conduct and ill-breeding. In the meantime, however, I had no notion of being thwarted touching the information I desired. There was one resource left me yet. I would go to the fountainhead. I would call forthwith upon the general himself and demand, in explicit terms, a solution of this abominable piece of mystery. Here, at least, there should be no chance for equivocation. I would be plain, positive, peremptory, as short as pie crust, as concise as Tacitus or Montesquieu. It was early when I called, and the general was dressing. But I pleaded urgent business, and was shown at once into his bedroom by an old negro valet, 
who remained in attendance during my visit. As I entered the chamber, I looked about, of course, for the occupant, but did not immediately perceive him. There was a large and exceedingly odd-looking bundle of something which lay close by my feet on the floor, and as I was not in the best humor in the world, I gave it a kick out of the way. Hem, ahem, rather civil that, I should say, said the bundle in one of the smallest and altogether the funniest little voices, between a squeak and a whistle that I ever heard in all the days of my existence. Ahem, rather civil that, I should observe. I fairly shouted with terror and made off at a tangent into the farthest extremity of the room. God bless me, my dear fellow. Here again whistled the bundle. What, 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 why, uh, what is the matter? I really believe you don't know me at all. What could I say to all this? What could I? I staggered into an armchair and, with staring eyes and open mouth, awaited the solution of the wonder. Strange you shouldn't know me, though, isn't it? Presently re-squeaked the nondescript, which I now perceived was performing upon the floor some inexplicable evolution, very analogous to the drawing on of a stocking. There was only a single leg, however, apparent. Strange you shouldn't know me, though, isn't it? Pompey, bring me that leg. Here Pompey handed the bundle a very capital cork leg, already dressed, which it screwed on in a trice, and then it stood up before my eyes. And a bloody action it was, continued the thing, as if in a soliloquy. But then one mustn't fight with the boogaboos and kickapoos, and think of coming off with a mere scratch. Pompey, I'll thank you now for that arm. Thomas, turning to me, is decidedly the best hand at a cork leg. But if you should ever want an arm, my dear fellow, you must really let me recommend you to Bishop. Here Pompey screwed on an arm. We had rather hot work of it, that you may say, Now, you dog, slip on my shoulders and bosom. Petit makes the best shoulders, but for a bosom you will have to go to Ducro. Bosom, said I. Pompey, will you never be ready with that wig? Scalping is a rough process after all, but then you can procure such a capital scratch at Delorme's. Scratch. Now you nigger my teeth. For a good set of these... You had better go to Parmley's at once. High prices, but excellent work. I swallowed some very capital articles, though, when the big boogaboo rammed me down with the butt-end of his rifle. Butt-end rammed down my eye. Oh, yes. By the by, my eye, here. Pompey, you scamp, screw it in. Those kickapoos are not so very slow at a gouge. But he's a belight man, that Dr. Williams. After all, you can't imagine how well I see with the eyes of his make. I now began very clearly to perceive that the object before me was nothing more nor less than my new acquaintance, Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith. The manipulations of Pompey had made, I must confess, a very striking difference in the appearance of the personal man. The voice, however, still puzzled me no little, but even this apparent mystery was speedily cleared up. Pompey, you black rascal, squeaked the general. I really do believe you would let me go out without my pallet. Hereupon, the negro, grumbling out an apology, went up to his master, opened his mouth with the knowing air of a horse jockey, 
and adjusted therein a somewhat singular-looking machine in a very dexterous manner that I could not altogether comprehend. The alteration, however, in the entire expression of the general's countenance was instantaneous and surprising. When he again spoke, his voice had resumed all the rich melody and strength which I had noticed upon our original introduction. Damn the vagabonds, said he in so clear a tone that I positively started at the change. Damn the vagabonds, they not only knocked in the roof of my mouth, but took the trouble to cut off at least seven-eighths of my tongue. There isn't Bonfanti's equal, however, in America for really good articles of this description. I can recommend you to him with confidence. Here the general bowed. And assure you that I have the greatest pleasure in so doing. I acknowledged his kindness in my best manner and took leave of him at once, with a perfect understanding of the true state of affairs, with a full comprehension of the mystery which had troubled me so long. It was evident. It was a clear case. Brevet Brigadier General John A.B.C. Smith was the man, was the man that was used up. End of section 15. Recording by Wupper Hippo. The Businessman by Edgar Allan Poe Method is the soul of business, old saying. I am a businessman. I am a methodical man. Method is the thing, after all. But there are no people I more heartily despise than your eccentric fools who prate about method without understanding it, attending strictly to its letter and violating its spirit. These fellows are always doing the most out-of-the-way things in what they call an orderly manner. Now here I conceive as a positive paradox. True method appertains to the ordinary and the obvious alone and cannot be applied to the outre. What definite idea can a body attach to such expressions as methodical jack -o dandy or a systematical will-o'-the-wisp? My notions upon this head might not have been so clear as they are, but for a fortunate accident which happened to me when I was a very little boy. A good-hearted old Irish nurse, whom I shall not forget in my will, took me up one day by the heels when I was making more noise than was necessary, and swinging me round two or three times, damned my ears for a screeching little salpane, and then knocked my head into a cocked hat against the bedpost. This, I say, decided my fate, and made my fortune. A bump arose at once on my sinciput, and turned out to be as pretty an organ of order as one shall see on a summer's day. Hence that positive appetite for system and regularity which has made me the distinguished man of business that I am. If there is anything on earth I hate, it is a genius. Your geniuses are all arrant asses. The greater the genius, the greater the ass, and to this rule there is no exception whatever. Especially, you cannot make a man of business out of a genius, any more than money out of a Jew, or the best nutmegs out of pine knots. The creatures are always going off at a tangent into some fantastic employment or ridiculous speculation entirely at variance with the fitness of things, and having no business whatever to be considered as a business at all. Thus, you may tell these characters immediately by the nature of their occupations. If you ever perceive a man setting up as a merchant or a manufacturer, or going into the cotton or tobacco trade or any of these eccentric pursuits, or getting to be a dry goods dealer or soap boiler or something of that kind, or pretending to be a lawyer or a blacksmith or a physician, anything out of the usual way, you may set him down at once as a genius, and then according to the rule of three, he's an ass. 
Now, I am not in any respect a genius, but a regular businessman. My daybook and ledger will evidence this in a minute. They are well kept, though I say it myself. And in my general habits of accuracy and punctuality, I am not to be beat by a clock. Moreover, my occupations have been always made to chime in with the ordinary habitudes of my fellow men. Not that I feel the least indebted upon this score to my exceedingly weak-minded parents, who, beyond doubt, would have made an arrant genius of me at last if my guardian angel had not come in good time to the rescue. In biography, the truth is everything, and in autobiography, it is especially so. Yet, I scarcely hope to be believed when I state, however solemnly, that my poor father put me, when I was about fifteen years of age, into the counting house of what he termed a respectable hardware and commission merchant doing a capital bit of business. A capital bit of fiddlestick! However, the consequence of this folly was that in two or three days I had to be sent home to my button-headed family in a high state of fever and with a most violent and dangerous pain in the cincy put all around about my organ of order. It was nearly a gone case with me then, just touch and go for six weeks, the physicians giving me up and all that sort of thing. But, although I suffered much, I was a thankful boy in the main. I was saved from being a respectable hardware and commission merchant doing a capital bit of business, and I felt grateful to the protuberance which had been the means of my salvation, as well as to the kind-hearted female who had originally put these means within my reach. The most of boys run away from home at ten or twelve years of age, but I waited till I was sixteen. I don't know that I should have gone even then, if I had not happened to hear my old mother talk about setting me up on my own hook in the grocery way. The grocery way! Only think of that! I resolved to be off forthwith and try and establish myself in some decent occupation without a dancing attendance any longer upon the caprices of these eccentric old people and running the risk of being made a genius of in the end. In this project I succeeded perfectly well at the first effort, and by the time I was fairly eighteen found myself doing an extensive and profitable business in the tailor's walking advertisement line. I was enabled to discharge the onerous duties of this profession only by that rigid adherence to system which formed the leading feature of my mind. A scrupulous method characterized my actions as well as my accounts. In my case, it was method, not money, which made the man. At least all of him that was not made by the tailor whom I served. At nine every morning I called upon that individual for the clothes of the day. Ten o'clock found me in some fashionable promenade or other place of public amusement. The precise regularity with which I turned my handsome person about, so as to bring successively into view every position of the suit upon my back, was the admiration of all the knowing men in the trade. Noon never passed without me bringing home a customer to the house of my employers, Messrs. Cut and Come Again. I say this proudly, but with tears in my eyes for the firm proved themselves the basis of ingrates. The little account about which we quarrelled and finally parted cannot in any item be thought overcharged by gentlemen really conversant with the nature of the business. Upon this point, however, I feel a degree of proud satisfaction in permitting the reader to judge for himself. My bill ran thus. <clears throat> Messrs. Cut and Come Again Merchant Tailors to Peter Prophet Walking Advertiser July the 10th To promenade as usual and customer brought home 25 cents July the 11th Ditto 25 cents July the 12th To One Lie Second Class Damaged Black Cloth Sold for Invisible Green 25 cents July the 13th to one lie, first class, extra quality and size, recommending milled satinette as broadcloth, 75 cents. July the 20th, to purchasing brand new paper shirt collar or dicky to set of grey Petersham, 2 cents. August the 15th, to wearing double padded bobtail frock, 
Thermometer 106 in the shade, 25 cents. August the 16th, standing on one leg, three hours. To show off new style strapped pants at 12 and a half cents per leg per hour, 37 and a half cents. August the 17th, to promenade as usual and large customer brought fat man 50 cents august the 18th ditto medium size 25 cents august the 19th ditto small man and bad pay six cents total two dollars 95 and a half cents the item chiefly disputed in this bill was the very moderate charge of two pennies for the dicky upon my word of honor this was not an unreasonable price for that dicky. It was one of the cleanest and prettiest little dickies I ever saw, and I have good reason to believe that it affected the sale of three Petershams. The elder partner of the firm, however, would allow me only one penny of the charge, and took it upon himself to show in what manner four of the same size conveniences could be got out of a sheet of full scap. But it is needless to say that I stood upon the principle of the thing, Business is business and should be done in a business way. There was no system whatever in swindling me out of a penny. A clear fraud of 50%. No method in any respect. I left at once the employment of Messrs. Cut and Come Again and set up in the eyesore line by myself. One of the most lucrative, respectable and independent of the ordinary occupations. My strict integrity, economy, and rigorous business habits here again came into play. I found myself driving a flourishing trade and soon became a marked man upon change. The truth is, I never dabbled in flashy matters, but jogged on in the good old sober routine of the calling. A calling in which I should no doubt have remained to the present hour, but for a little accident which happened to me in the prosecution of one of the usual business operations of the profession. Whenever a rich old hunks or prodigal heir or bankrupt corporation gets into the notion of putting up a palace, there is no such thing in the world as stopping either of them, and this every intelligent person knows. The fact in question is indeed the basis of the eyesore trade. As soon, therefore, as a building project is fairly afoot by one of these parties, we merchants secure a nice corner of the lot in contemplation or a prime little situation just adjoining or right in front. This done, we wait until the palace is halfway up, and then we pay some tasty architect to run us up an ornamental mud hovel, right against it, or a down east, or Dutch pagoda, or a pigsty, or an ingenious little bit of fancy work, with the Eskimo, Kickapoo, or Hottentot. Of course, we can't afford to take these structures down under a bonus of 500% upon the prime cost of our lot and plaster. Can we? I ask the question. I ask it of businessmen. It would be irrational to suppose that we can. And yet there was a rascally corporation which asked me to do this very thing. This very thing. I did not reply to their absurd proposition, of course but I felt it a duty to go that same night and lamp-black the whole of their palace. For this, the unreasonable villains clapped me into jail, and the gentlemen of the eyesore trade could not well avoid cutting my connection when I came out. The assault and battery business into which I was now forced to adventure for a livelihood was somewhat ill-adapted to the delicate nature of my constitution, but I went to work in it with a good heart and found my account here, as heretofore, in these stern habits of methodical accuracy, which have been thumped into me by that delightful old nurse. I would indeed be the basest of men not to remember her well in my will. By observing, as I say, the strictest system in all my dealings, and keeping a well-regulated set of books, I was enabled to get over many serious difficulties, and in the end to establish myself very decently in the profession. The truth is that few individuals in any line did a snugger little business than I. I will just copy a page or so out of my daybook, and this will save me the necessity of blowing my own trumpet, a contemptible practice of which no high-minded man will be guilty. Now the daybook is a thing that don't lie. January the 1st, New Year's Day. Met snap in the street, groggy, memo, he'll do. 
Met Gruff shortly afterwards, blind drunk, memo, he'll answer too. Entered both gentlemen into my ledger and opened a running account with each. January the 2nd. Saw Snap at the exchange and went up and trod on his toe. Doubled his fists and knocked me down. Good. Got up again. Some trifling difficulty with Bag, my attorney. I want the damages at a thousand, but he says that for so simple a knockdown we can't lay them at more than five hundred. Memo must get rid of Bag. No system at all. January the 3rd. Went to the theatre to look for Gruff, saw him sitting in a side box in the second tier between a fat lady and a lean one. Quizzed the whole party through an opera glass till I saw the fat lady blush and whisper to G. Went round then into the box, put my nose within reach of his hand, wouldn't pull it, no go. Blew it and tried again, no go. Sat down then and winked at the lean lady when I had the high satisfaction of finding him lift me up by the nape of the neck and fling me over the pit. Neck dislocated and right leg capitally splintered. Went home in high glee, drank a bottle of champagne and booked the young man for 5,000. Bag says it'll do. February the 15th, compromised the case of Mr. Snap, amount entered in journal, 50 cents, which see. February the 16th, cast by that ruffian gruff who made me a present of $5. Costs of suit, $4.25. Net profit, see journal, 75 cents. Now here is a clear gain in a very brief period of no less than $1.25. This is in the mere case of snap and gruff. And I solemnly assure the reader that these extracts are taken at random from my day book. It's an old saying, and a true one, however, that money is nothing in comparison with health. I found the exactions of the profession somewhat too much for my delicate state of body, and discovering at last that I was knocked all out of shape, so that I didn't know very well what to make of the matter, and so that my friends, or when they met me in the street, couldn't tell that I was Peter Prophet at all, it occurred to me that the best expedient I could adopt was to alter my line of business. I turned my attention, therefore, to mud dabbling, and continued it for some years. The worst of this occupation is that too many people take a fancy to it, and the competition is in consequence excessive. Every ignoramus of a fellow who finds that he hasn't brains in sufficient quantity to make his way as a walking advertiser, or an eyesore prig, or a salt and batter man, thinks, of course, that he'll answer very well as a dabbler of mud. But there never was entertained a more erroneous idea than that it requires no brains to mud-dabble. Especially, there is nothing to be made in this way without method. I did only a retail business myself, but my old habits of system carried me swimmingly along. I selected my street crossing in the first place with great deliberation, and I never put down a broom in any other part of town but that. I took care, too, to have a nice little puddle at hand, which I could get at in a minute. And by these means, I got to be well known as a man to be trusted. And this is one half the battle, let me tell you, in trade. Nobody ever failed to pitch me a copper, and got over my crossing with a clean pair of pantaloons. And as my business habits in this respect were sufficiently understood, I never met with any attempt at imposition. I wouldn't have put up with it if I had. Never imposing upon anyone myself, I suffered no one to play the possum with me. The frauds of the banks, of course, I couldn't help. Their suspension put me to ruinous inconvenience. These, however, are not individuals but corporations, and corporations, it is very well known, have neither bodies to be kicked nor souls to be damned. I was making money at this business when, in an evil moment, I was induced to merge in that core spattering, a somewhat analogous but by no means so respectable a profession. My location, to be sure, was an excellent one, being central, and I had capital blacking and brushes. My little dog, too, was quite fat and up to all varieties of snuff. He had been in the trade a long time and, I may say, understood it. Our general routine was this. Pompey, having rolled himself well in the mud, sat upon end at the shop door until he observed a dandy approaching in bright boots. He then proceeded to meet him and gave the Wellingtons a rub or two with his wool. 
then the dandy swore very much and looked about for a boot black. There I was, full in his view with blacking and brushes. It was only a minute's work, and then came a sixpence. This did moderately well for a time. In fact, I was not avaricious, but my dog was. I allowed him a third of the profit, but he was advised to insist upon half. This I couldn't stand, so we quarrelled and parted. I next tried my hand at the organ grinding for a while, and may say that I made out pretty well. It is a plain, straightforward business and requires no particular abilities. You can get a music mill for a mere song, and to put it in order, you have but to open the works and give them three or four smart raps with a hammer. It improves the tone of the thing, for business purposes, more than you can imagine. This done, you have only to stroll along with the mill on your back until you see tan bark in the street and a knocker wrapped up in buckskin. Then you stop and grind, looking as if you meant to stop and grind till doomsday. Presently a window opens and somebody pitches you a sixpence with a request to uh, hush up and go on, etc. I am aware that some grinders have actually afforded to go on for this sum, but for my part I found the necessary outlay of capital too great to permit of my going on under a shilling. At this occupation I did a good deal, but somehow I was not quite satisfied, and so finally abandoned it. The truth is, I laboured under the disadvantage of having no monkey, and American streets are so muddy, and a democratic rabble is so obtrusive and so full of demnition mischievous little boys. I was now out of employment for some months, but at length succeeded by dint of great interest in procuring a situation in the sham post. The duties here are simple and not altogether unprofitable, for example. Very early in the morning I had to make up my packet of sham letters. Upon the inside of each of these I had to scrawl a few lines on any subject which occurred to me as sufficiently mysterious, signing all the epistles Tom Dobson or, or Bobby Tompkins or anything in that way. Having folded and sealed all and stamped them with sham postmarks, New Orleans, Bengal, Botany Bay or any other place a great way off. I set out forthwith upon my daily routine, as if in a great hurry. I always called at the big houses to deliver the letters and receive the postage. Nobody hesitates at paying for a letter, especially for a double one. People are such fools, and it was no trouble to get around a corner before there was time to open the epistles. The worst of this profession was that I had to walk so much, and so fast, and so frequently to vary my route. Besides, I had serious scruples of conscience can't bear to hear innocent individuals abused, and the way the whole town took to cursing Tom Dobson and Bobby Tompkins was really awful to hear. I washed my hands of the matter in disgust. My eighth and last speculation has been in the cat-growing way. I have found this a most pleasant and lucrative business, and really no trouble at all. The country, it is well known, has become infested with cats, so much so of late, that a petition for relief most numerously and respectably signed was brought before the legislature at its last memorable session. The assembly at this epoch was unusually well informed, and having passed many other wise and wholesome enactments, it crowned all with the Cat Act. In its original form, this law offered a premium for cat heads, fourpence apiece, uh, but the Senate succeeded in amending the main clause so as to substitute the word tails for heads. This amendment was so obviously proper that the House concurred in it nem com. As soon as the Governor had signed the bill, I invested my whole estate in the purchase of Toms and Tabbies. At first, I could only afford to feed them upon mice, which are cheap, but they fulfilled the scriptural injunction at so marvellous a rate that I at length considered it my best policy to be liberal and so indulged them in oysters and turtle. Their tails at a legislative price now bring me in a good income, for I have discovered a way in which by means of Macassar oil I can force three crops in a year. It delights me to find too that the animals soon get accustomed to the thing and would rather have the appendages cut off than otherwise. I consider myself therefore a made man, and am bargaining for a country seat on the Hudson. End of section 16. Recording by Joseph Finkberg.